We're looking at Acts chapter 22 this uh, morning. Acts chapter 22 as we continue our study in the book of Acts. And our study in the second half of the Acts of the Apostles is primarily focused just on one apostle. His name is Paul. And Paul has taken three missionary journeys already in our study. And he has done this in order to bring the gospel, the glorious gospel it says in chapter 20, to not only the Jewish people but also to the Gentiles. Uh, now he is returning to Jerusalem after traveling through much of Asia Minor and he has taken up a considerable offering for people who are suffering in Jerusalem. And so James and the elders of the city gather to him and uh, they are going to give Paul advice about the opposition that he is sure to face. Opposition that he was warned about by the Holy Spirit as he was approaching Jerusalem. And we saw that as we paralleled the life of Paul with the Lord Jesus uh, last week when we looked at Acts chapter 21. Now the end of Acts chapter 21 depicted a riot that broke out in the temple. Primarily, the Jews had said Paul had taken this Ephesian Gentile, his name was Trophimus, and brought him into the temple. Now what he means by that, he brought him into a place where Gentiles are forbidden to go. Now the temple was cordoned off into different sections. Uh, there was a section for Gentiles, but the charge was you've brought him into a section that you should not have brought him into. Of course, uh, he didn't do this, but that didn't matter. The Jews beat him severely, and it caused quite a commotion, so much so that a Roman commander came to investigate the matter, and uh, you know, when the Romans came marching, then the Jews stopped beating. Uh, that's exactly what happens here. If they didn't, uh, then they were going to be in for uh, great punishment themselves. But that didn't stop them from seething in great anger over the fact that uh, Paul uh, was bringing the gospel uh, to the Gentiles or um, had taught that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They were very uh, angry and they were determined to kill him. Now we enter... Acts chapter 22 and the Roman commander has just given Paul permission to defend himself before this Jewish crowd uh, mob really and Acts chapter 22 contains Paul's defense before this crowd that God will supernaturally quiet at least for a time uh, then Paul is going to defend himself before the Roman commander near the end of the chapter and then that will lead to yet another defense when we get to the, a, a second cliffhanger there in Acts chapter 23. Uh, Paul in Acts chapter 23 will have to defend himself again before the Sanhedrin, this august body of Jewish religious leaders. Actually, if you think about it, the rest of the Acts of the Apostles is taken up with a wrestling match between Jewish and Roman authorities over the fate of the Apostle Paul, all the way up to chapter 28 in the finish of our study. And so once Paul appeals to Caesar, he is going to begin a long journey to Rome. And this is, of course, the will of God. It has already been prophesied that he would be bound and that he would be delivered over to the Gentiles. And so this is happening. This is the process that he must go through in order to accomplish the will of God. You would think that by the time he gets to the end of his defense here, that he would meet with the same end that Stephen met with, the same end that Jesus Christ met with, and that is their martyrdom. Uh, but that is not what happens with Paul. So God doesn't do exactly the same thing in all believers. He's working through us to do different things and to accomplish different objectives. And so if we give our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, if we live with Him for him, uh, then we will know for sure that we also will be willing to die for him. Uh, and we looked at that whole concept last week. Now, what's important is, as you look at Paul and his opportunity to minister in Rome, by the time he gets to Rome, he's going to have at least two full years where he's going to minister there. That's what it says at the end of the Acts of the Apostles. So his death is not imminent. 
We always think that way, don't we? As a matter of fact, the Bible, nowhere in the New Testament do we have uh, a record of Paul's death. It's all very optimistic. He leaves the pages of Scripture still uh, witnessing and testifying to Christ. That's what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, uh, if you're going to find details concerning his death, uh, then you're going to have to look to extra-biblical sources. And extra-biblical sources record by tradition that Paul is eventually going to be arrested by uh, the Emperor Nero, and he's going to be taken to the Apian Way and there beheaded because he's a Roman. He would not be crucified, uh, but beheaded. So with all of this, we begin Paul's final journey then in the book of Acts to Rome. And with all of this, let's keep in mind what Paul himself says to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So Paul witness, uh, his witness to Christ then becomes a catalyst for us and our own witness. It leads us to Rome. It leads us out into the world to be able to give people our own testimony, to witness to Christ. That's what it means. And so what we're going to do is we're going to examine uh, the anatomy of a witness to Christ today. The anatomy of a witness to Christ. And we will break this chapter into three major sections. Um, there are three divisions within chapter 22 uh, of the book of Acts. And we dissect the chapter and find in these three major arteries a witness to Christ, pumping life into our own testimony. We often refer to our witness to Christ as our testimony. You've ever heard anybody say that? I, I have this testimony. We all have an individual testimony or our witness to Christ. First, there's our life before conversion. This is the way I was before my conversion to Christ. And then, secondly, there is the point of conversion. And then, third, there is my life after my conversion. So let's look at this first artery of an effective testimony for Christ, and that is my life before my conversion. Uh, you say, what's going to happen here in the first section? Well, Paul is going to, he's going to provide for us his background, but then he is, before he came to Christ, but then he is also going to provide for us his bias. He's going to give us his stated bias. This is why I live the way that I live before I met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And we've already covered that in Acts chapter 9, so it would be somewhat of a review for us. But it's important that we look, first of all, at his background in verses 1 through 3. Uh, there we read, brethren and fathers. Now he's standing before this mob. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born of Tar in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Okay, they're in Jerusalem. I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. So when he was young, he spent time under the tutelage of this famous Jewish rabbi named Gamaliel that we met in Acts chapter 5. And I was taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. In other words, I see me in you as you clamor to beat and kill me because I was there. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, right? So the word defense here is really, really important because it's where we get our English word uh, for an apologetic. If you look at it in the Greek, it's a transliteration. Right over from the Greek language, we use the Greek word apologia. We use it in our English language. We call it an apologetic or an apology. So many think that apologetics involves knowing the ins and outs of every aberrant belief that is out there. Uh, my personal opinion is that that is a bad way to develop an apologetic. If you are constantly studying aberrant beliefs, you're going down the wrong road. The way that you develop a good apologetic is you know the genuine truth so well 
That error never stands a chance in your life. That's how you develop a good apologetic. Apologetics is knowing the genuine truth as we see it in the Word of God. And so your best apologetic is a transformed life. It's your life. It's your testimony. It's your witness to Christ. And people see that and they believe. Peter uses the very same word and he's talking about the very same concept in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. There we read uh, Peter encouraging us to set the Lord God apart in our hearts. Now think about that. Peter says, I want you to set the Lord God apart in your hearts. In other words, there should be your heart here and it should be the Lord God hermetically sealed there. And you're not going to give that heart to anyone else. God has your heart first and foremost. That's where an effective testimony begins. When you set the Lord God apart in your hearts. And you don't let anyone else deter you from that objective. But then Peter goes on and he says, And to be always ready to give a apologia, a defense of, to everyone, to everyone that you come across. Uh, defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, why would they ask you? Because they see the hope in you. They're not asking if they don't see hope. All right? If they see gloom and doom coming, they're not asking. All right? If they see hope coming, they're asking. I want what you have. It's infectious. I'm sorry about my voice today. It's really bad. I'm probably going to lose it, but it'll be worth it. All right? So he says, the defense that is in you, that this, this, this defense you're going to give to people, you give it because that's hope. And, and that is going to come through the channels, two channels, meekness and fear. Meekness means I'm relying upon God's power to give people my testimony. And fear means I care more about what God thinks than what other people think. Right? So I'm willing to, to share the gospel with anyone who will listen to me. You say, but people won't listen to me. Well, maybe you need to work on your own relationship with God first so that they will listen to you. You know what I mean? Because I think that a lot of people see Mr. Self-Righteous coming. And they don't want to listen to Mr. Self-Righteous. A lot of people see Mr. Gloom and Doom coming. And they don't want to listen to Mr. Gloom and Doom. Okay, what people want to hear is a person that has hope. A person that is stirred by the Holy Spirit that is working in their lives. And so Paul is saying, look, I share your background. And the mob quiets. But, but Paul also says to them, look, I want to tell you something. I was as zealous as you are this day in persecuting other people. As a matter of fact, he's going to say concerning the law, Philippians chapter 3 verse 5, I was a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was zealous in persecuting people. He's going to discern that he is talking to a crowd that is filled with both Sadducees and Pharisees when we get to Acts chapter 23 and verse 6. And in Acts chapter 26 and verse 5, he's going to add that in the strictest sense of the Jewish religion, he lived as a Pharisee. So there is no doubt at all, even though it's not explicitly mentioned in our text here, but there is no doubt at all that Paul was a Pharisee. And he's going to use that background in his testimony because that's truthful. As a matter of fact, he will say, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisee because I was trained by the man. I was trained by Gamaliel. He was this rabbi and you all know him, right? So we first meet Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5 and he's the guy who said to the Sanhedrin at the time, listen, um, you know this Christianity thing will fizzle out. 20 years later, not so much, right? Uh, but it, it will fizzle out, and, and, and he was very pragmatic about it. If it is of God, the thing will stand. If it's not, there's not anything we can do about it. And so he, he gives that advice to the, to the council. Well, Paul says, I was trained by that guy. I spent a significant amount of my youth under the tutelage of Gamaliel. Now, he's not bragging on this. He's just telling them the facts. He, he, he was zealous. I, I'm as zealous as you are today. I was as zealous as you are, and I would have had the same heart that you have heart right now, the same heart that you have right now, a murderous heart. 
a heart that led to the stoning of Stephen, which is probably something that Paul never forgot. He looked on approvingly, the Bible says, while he guarded the coats of the people that stoned and martyred Stephen. So Paul is fleshing out then some brief background in order to give us an idea of what he was like before his conversion. But Paul also states his definite bias. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now Paul uses a, a title for Christianity, he calls it the way. But this, just like being called a Christian, was a term of derision in, at this particular time. Oh, those people, those Christians, those little Christ, they're of the way, you know, because he's really exclusive, this Jesus. And he's, he said, I'm the way, the truth. And the so for them, it was a bad thing. For us, it's a good thing. You say, well, Christianity is intolerant of everything else and it's not exclusive. Guilty as charged. That's exactly right. That's the point. He is the way. And so Paul uses this term that they use to marginalize Christians uh, to his advantage. Not much has changed, by the way. Um, there are still people that viciously oppose Christianity. And if you were one of them, then it would be good in your testimony to admit to that. Not to cover it over, but God can use that in a very powerful way. I was an atheist. I was against Christianity. I viciously opposed it. I wrote about it. I did all of these things. And, and yet, I, I came to find out that it's all true. God can use your testimony in that way. The fact that the Jewish leaders sanctioned the approval of his actions, which he mentions here, uh, that makes his testimony all the more powerful. Then he mentions the council uh, of the elders, which is a reference to the Sanhedrin. Even though many years have passed, maybe uh, 20 years or so, many of the leadership would have remembered Saul of Tarsus. And they would have remembered him as a persecutor. Um, thank you, Mike. They would have remembered him as a persecutor. He, he, he is a man who uh, was really zealous in going to, to uh, these places where Christians were. He would find them, he'd arrest them, he'd bring them back to Jerusalem, and uh, we would put them on trial. Uh, other times, uh, he would even take these forays way off into the distance and find Christians there and, 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 and get them to, and he was involved in murder of Christians. They would all know that because they approved of his actions. They sanctioned his actions. Now I'd like us to scan all the way ahead in the chapter to verse 20 for a moment. And we see his bias stated there too. In verse 20 he says, And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. When we read that, don't we see his bias? We see it very clearly. So these men would be able, and women, would be able to relate with the Apostle Paul. I mean, one of the details that we find out from Stephen's death is that he had a face that was the face of an angel. There was innocence, a, a placid demeanor, as he looked up into the heavens and saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. Whenever I think that, I get the, the chills just thinking about it. Here's a man that stood for Christ, even at the end of his life, and... Paul was part of that. I don't think Paul ever forgot about that. Maybe he, he didn't get the chills like we get the chills in thinking about it. Maybe he looked back and there was just pain. You say, but surely he knew he was forgiven. Yes, he did, but can you imagine ever shaking those images? I, I think I would... You talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, that would be very, very difficult to shake, wouldn't it? He was a part of that. And I think that right here, Paul is willing to face the same kind of death that Stephen faced. That's what motivates his defense. I'm willing to die for Christ right here and now, but God is not going to allow that just yet. So we have a clear picture of Paul's background, his bias, 
in his pre-conversion days. This will lead us to the second main artery in our anatomy of a testimony for Christ. And we consider the conversion itself. The conversion itself. Uh, verse 6. You know, I, I think what we have in verse 6 is we have revelation. And that runs us all the way up to verse 10. And then verses 11 through 16, the idea is response. Because in order for conversion to take place, there must be revelation. If there's no revelation, then nobody can be saved. And then you say, well, what about this response? Response is not possible without God first working and revealing himself to man. It's just not possible. But both of these aspects have to be present in conversion. I would say then too that conversion is not possible if a man will not respond. And so that's what the Bible clearly teaches. God reveals himself, man responds. To go beyond that is to go beyond the Bible. Now verse 6 says, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid. But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all the things which are appointed for you to do. Say, what would have happened if the Lord Jesus Christ had not revealed himself to Paul that day? He would have gone on persecuting people, Christians. He would have gone to Damascus and do what he planned to do. But that's not what happened. Sometimes people want to talk about hypotheticals. Oh, I wonder what would have happened if, if I never made that decision for Christ. Well, you're dealing in the realm of hypothetical land, you know. And that is a, a fantasy land. And it really is useful, useless thinking. It's vain to dwell in hypothetical land. You have to dwell with the way things really are. Isn't that what Philippians 4 eight teaches? Yeah. Think on things that are real, true. So if the Lord Jesus had not revealed himself to Paul, we don't know. But we know that he was planning to persecute the church. This is Paul's first-hand account of his conversion experience. We didn't get it in a first-hand accounting when we read it from Luke in Acts chapter 9. Now we're getting it from him uh, years after the fact. He says this light, it shone from heaven. It was brighter than even the noonday sun. And, and of course, what is this light? Well, it's Jesus. You say, what is the light of the world that's, that's fairer even than the noonday sun? It's Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world and the glory of God. And so Paul fell to the ground helpless. I don't think we often think about that. If we're going to submit to Jesus, we've got to fall to the ground helpless. Because we are helpless. We have to acknowledge that. We have to surrender ourselves to him. And so the Lord Jesus began with a question. Could Paul answer that question? No, Paul couldn't answer that question. Why are you persecuting me? Huh? Why? What? Paul didn't know what he was talking about. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, I'm sure he's searching his mind and he's thinking to himself, how is it possible that I could be persecuting this light that has shown to me that is fairer than the noonday sun? This is the Lord. And he's speaking to me. How is it that I could have been the one persecuting him? That's the idea here. And, and so we get this question. Paul was not persecuting uh, heretics like he thought. I'm persecuting the Lord who made me. The Lord that's this great and glorious light. And so this has to dawn on him. You say, how does it dawn on him? Remember when we said we need to know who Jesus is and what he did for us in the last chapter? Well, what does Paul ask? Who are you? That's a good question. Who are you? And what does he say? I am Jesus. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. As a matter of fact, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I'm not only this great and glorious light, 
I'm not only God, fully God, I'm fully man. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. And you are persecuting me by persecuting my followers. Can you imagine what that did to Paul? Well, I know what it did. It transformed him. It moved him from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in a moment of time. And did he continue on to Damascus? Yes, he did. But not in his own power. He was led by the hand. You think that was a humbling experience for a man that was en route to persecute Christians, all this great power? Where did all these people that were with him, his retinue, go, by the way? This man's crazy in the head. We didn't hear any voice. We heard some sounds. We saw some light. But we don't know what's going on here. You see it? But Paul heard it. And Paul knew. Paul will say to the Romans that this Jesus is the Christ who came according to the flesh, but who is also over all and the eternally blessed God. Romans chapter 9 and verse 5. Jesus is God. And Paul finally figures that out. In Titus chapter 2, he will say, Jesus is the great God and Savior who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Paul asks the right question, Who are you? Have you asked the right question? Who are you, Lord? Because God has the answer in his word. He's Jesus the Son of God, of Nazareth, fully God, fully man, and he died for you. But then Paul asks the question, what shall I do? <laughs> Paul and his companions are stunned. They look at the glorious light, and he discerns it's the actual voice of the Lord Jesus. What, about, what do I do? And, and the answer comes back, you're going to submit yourself to my lordship. You say, how does he do that at first? He is taken by the hand to Damascus. You say, how do we know that he is a follower of Christ? He is taken by the hand to Damascus. When Ananias comes into Paul, what does he call him right at the very beginning? What does he call him? Do you see it? He calls him brother. He's a brother. He is a brother already. And so this is, his, this is feathering into his response. Look at verse six, uh, 11. rather. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. And he, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, now remember, he's already converted. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you. For what purpose? That you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away all your sins, or wash away your sins rather, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice some things about this particular passage. Note that Ananias, first of all, addresses Saul as brother. So in doing that, that helps allay maybe a problem that you have already thought of as I read of verse 16. Right? What is that problem in verse 16? Do you know what it is? Baptismal regeneration, right? Do you see it? In other words, there are people who teach that you need to be baptized in order to have your sins cleansed away. This is the problem with what we call proof texting the Bible. And I'm sad to say that even Christians do this. They'll take a verse... They'll remove it from its context in order to fortify their position. And it is a position that runs contrary to Scripture. There are people out there today, and do you know they are teaching that if you are not baptized, you cannot be a believer in Jesus Christ. Well, that's false. You say, well, how do you know that's false? Well, the Bible is very clear about this. Uh, people, 
uh, are saved by the blood of Christ and by the blood of Christ alone. It is not by anything that we do, but that uh, work that Jesus Christ accomplished for us. We put our trust in him and in him alone. So when you look at a false doctrine that people are using verse 16 to present, you have to say, look, buddy, we need to look at the whole of Scripture in order to understand this verse. The context of Scripture teaches that a person is saved by faith alone in Christ alone. That's what the Bible teaches. Faith is not a work. It's a response to God. But baptism is a work. All right, That is a religious ritual. That's all that it is if you are uh, utilizing it as a mode of salvation. Uh, you say, what happens? A person goes down into the water and they're washed clean of their sin? No. That has already taken place through the blood of Christ. The baptism is a picture of that purging of sin. I am identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that's what is being talked about here in verse 16. Paul had humbled himself. And Paul um, recovered his sight. And God chose that Paul would know his will, see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. And so now we know that Paul would know, he would see, and he would hear. And that needs to be included in our own testimony. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you see him working in your life? Do you hear him through the pages of Scripture? That needs to be a part of your testimony. This is God's threefold purpose for Paul. It's God's threefold purpose for us. Now Ananias predicted that, that Paul would be a witness to all men of what he had seen and heard, it says. Paul the persecutor then would become Paul the preacher. He would become Paul the apostle. And all of these things would be unfolded in time. Paul looks at this idea of water baptism in another place in Scripture that might help you with verse 16. If anyone takes you to verse 16 in Acts chapter 22 in order to defend water baptism, I'd like you to put this reference next to this verse. It might be a help to you. It is 1 Corinthians 1, verses 14 through 17. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 14 through 17. And here's what the Word of God says there. Paul speaking, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Why? Now here's the important part. For Christ did not send me to baptize. See that? He did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That means he is setting baptism, all right, in a separate category than the gospel. Baptism is not a part of the gospel. He sent me to preach the gospel, not to baptize, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That's very clear. We always interpret unclear scripture in the light of very clear scripture. That is a principle in hermeneutics that people often forget when they rest and pervert the scripture out of its context. So the key words in this passage distinguish water baptism from the gospel. They are not one and the same and one is not a part of the other. The thief on the cross was not baptized. And yet, he saw Jesus in paradise that very day. Water baptism does not save. Jesus saves. That's the fact. Jesus is fully God and fully man. It says in the Bible that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might have the righteousness of God in him. So, he died, he was buried, he rose again the third day to deliver us. Through his resurrection, he delivered to us the righteousness of God. We have it. Now we need to live it out. This is revelation. I am giving you God's revelation today as best as I can. How will you respond to God's revelation? That's the key. Now that 
you say, well, I've already responded. And most of you probably would say, I've already responded. I've responded to the finished work of Christ. I'm not trusting in myself. I'm trusting in, in, in the fact that Jesus is indeed God, that he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again in order to purge all my sins away and to give me his righteousness. I'm trusting in Jesus, Pastor O. Well, then you will experience what is called life after conversion. This is the third main artery in Paul's anatomy of a witness to Christ. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, we can sum it up, life after conversion, that is, by saying that we are saved and then we are sent. You say, but I know I'm saved from the wrath of God, but Paul is saying, not only are you saved from the wrath of God, you are saved from the wrath of men. You say, but I thought men could, could take my body. And, and, and mangle it and persecute me and kill me. Yes, they can, but what, what can they not do? They can't take your soul and, and send it to hell. Only God can destroy both body and soul in hell forever, right? So, in other words, God has delivered me from this fear that, 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 that's out there, this fear of men and, and, and this idea that I have to somehow please people in order to curry favor with them. No, it, it, it is the power of God that does the work of ministry. And so that's the idea here. Uh, when we look at this, we see it very clearly, I think, in verse uh, 17, this idea of being saved from the wrath of men. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and, and saw him saying to me, Now, in our men's meeting, we talked about the many times that Paul had experienced visions. This was one of those times. He says, I was in a trance. And saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death, and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. You know, this is where you get the concept that Christians who are on this earth are going to remain on this earth until God is done with them. You say, what do you mean? I'm not advocating a foolish life, but I am saying that you can go forward confidently in your life knowing that is, if God has a purpose for you, he will keep your heart beating until he's done with you. I believe that. I really do. And so as I think about that, when Paul had later returned to Jerusalem, he received one of his many revelations that's talked about in 2 Corinthians 12, 6 and 7. And, and he speaks of these revelations. Paul was praying, it says in the text, when he received the warning. And, and people would not receive Paul's testimony. Paul approved of Stephen's martyrdom, he says, and, and he guarded the coats of the men that killed him. So Paul will face this death as well. In other words, he's saying, if I'm going to die right here and now, I'm ready to do so. I'm ready to die for Christ. Why? Because Paul was already willing to live for Christ, to be bound for Christ, to be beaten for Christ. So he was certainly willing to die for Christ. As a matter of fact, we could look at that as the easy way out in some respects. Isn't that true? I mean, because initially it's very hard the moment we die, right? <laughs> but right after we die, where are we as Christians? In the presence of our glorious God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is exciting. And so Paul knew that and he grabbed hold of that and so that helped him to overcome the fear of men. I'm not going to be worried about the wrath of men because I've been saved from the wrath of God. That's the idea. So what did he save him to do? He saved him to send him out. Send him out to do what? To preach the glorious gospel of the kingdom of God. And that's what we see in verse 21. Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And boy, you don't get any further than Rome. And that's exactly where he's heading. You see, I thought he was already preaching to Gentiles in all of his missionary journeys, and he's going to continue to do so. Paul is going to 
go right to Rome, and right in the heart of Rome, he's going to lead people to Christ. Paul is so burdened for the Gentiles. By the way, why do you think Paul is burdened for the Gentiles? Well, verse 21. God put that burden for it. They're in his heart, right at his conversion. You're going to go, you're going to preach to the Gentiles. Now that is... That is looking back on a life that has been recorded for us. You say, how do I know the burden and, 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 and the desires that God has for me? Oh, that's a good question. How do you know that? You know it by drawing from the grace of God. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, let me ask you, how much time did you spend feeding on God's word this week? I didn't say reading through it just to get your four chapters done. I'm talking about thinking about it throughout the day and taking principles and concepts and applying them to your life. And how much time did you spend in prayer to God this week? Because those are the two main ways that we draw supernatural enabling grace from God. And if we're not feeding on his word, if we're not communing with him, if we're not praying, then we don't have what we need to live life. We're walking according to the flesh. We're not walking according to the spirit. And so it's no wonder that our testimony is ineffective. You say, well, it was pretty ineffective for, for Paul too, Pastor. I mean, look at this. Uh, look at the reaction to uh, his witness to Christ here in verse 22. And they listened to him until this word. Until what word? That he was sent for the Gentiles. No way. They're dogs. You know what I mean? That, that's what the Jewish people are thinking. We don't go to dogs with the word of God. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't consider us dogs? Because I don't know many of you that are Jewish here. Maybe there is somebody, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of it. I, I don't know that I have any Jewish blood in me. So I'd be a Gentile dog. But I'm in the beloved one. That's what the Bible teaches. They listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices, and they said, away with such a fellow from the earth. In other words, let's kill him. For he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothing and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks. Good move. And said that he should be examined under scourging. Who else was examined under scourging? The Lord Jesus, right? You see the parallels continue from last week. So that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, prophecy fulfilled. Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Jesus remained silent when he was beaten. But Paul said, hey, is it right for you guys to beat a Roman this way? I would have taken that out too. All of us would. And so he asked a very simple question. And when the centurion heard it, he stopped everything and he went back to the commander saying, take care what you do for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. And the commander answered, with a large sum I obtained the citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen of Rome. That's what he's talking about there. Then immediately those who were about to examine him, the centurions, the people examine, right, examine, beat him. Those that were about to beat him and scourge him withdrew from him. And the commander was so was also afraid after he found out he was a Roman because he had bound him. And that's against the law. It's against the law to bind a Roman. It's against the law to scourge a Roman. And, and the, the commander could hardly believe it. Here's a man tattered in rags and the Jews want to kill him. And, and I can't hardly believe he's a Roman citizen. And he says, look at all the wealth I have. And I've got this position. And I had to pay a great sum of money to get it. And Paul says, I was born a Roman. You say, what does that mean? Well, Paul had lived in a day when they didn't dole out Roman citizenship to the highest bidder. Paul lived in a day when he was a Roman because he was born in a Roman family. His, his father was a Roman. And so, Centurion and, and the people that were beating him wisely withdrew, but the commander couldn't. 
He's in a fix now. And so the next day, because the commander wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds, important, and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. And then we're, we're here with another cliffhanger. Paul is going to have to defend himself once again in chapter 23. But who is he going to stand before this time? The Sanhedrin. Did anyone else that we know stand before the Sanhedrin? The Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see it? Do you see all of the parallels? Uh, this is amazing. It, it seems to me that nothing is going to deter Paul from serving God. And, and we have here uh, Paul, even we're, we're told that even this visible reaction against him, there's, there's nothing that's going to stop God from preserving his life. And the Bible is going to go on and tell us that Paul will dwell in Rome for two full years as a part of this process. You say, well, what, what will happen there? Well, he will preach the kingdom of God according to Acts chapter 28 and verse 31 and teach things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Why do you suppose Paul was so confident in Rome for those two years? Because he could hardly believe he was alive. How many times did he face death and defy it? He is on this earth until God is done with him. You, Christian, are on this earth until God is done with you. And that is great news. Because I don't want to be here one moment longer if God is done with me. And I hope that you have the same mindset. Let's pray together. Father, we all have our own unique conversion story. We all as individuals have a before, during, and after in our relationship with you if we're Christians here this morning. Give us the courage to be good witnesses to Jesus Christ, your Son. We ask that you would remind us this week to share our faith with other people who need to be saved. Give us grace to live for you. Make us a blessing to others. We pray it in Jesus' name.